Tonight we're going to talk about things that happened between 115 and 170 years ago. But um, we shouldn't forget that there were people here a lot longer ago than that. So 2,000 years ago, when Jesus was a teenager, there were people right here. 5,000 years ago, when the civilization we now call ancient Egypt was in its infancy, there were people right here. 20,000 years ago, when there was a land bridge over to Tassie and megafauna stalking around the landscape, there were people here, and there were people here a lot longer ago than that. As you probably know, we're on uh, towards the middle, towards the middle of the Kulin Nation in the Woiwurrung language group, and specifically around where we are here, the Wurundjeri Willem people. Here's a photo of a Wurundjeri woman and her son. And I just want to make a couple of points about this photo. The first one is to point out that her son has a European father. Um, Colonisation happens not just to land, but it happens to bodies and minds as well. The other point I want to make about the photo is that it's a photo I'm quite familiar with, but I found it hard to find to, in order to show it to you tonight. And the reason why is because the State Library of Victoria uh, catalogue and the Culture Victoria database have changed the name of the, of the photograph from the name that I know it by. And I understand why they have done that, because there's two different terms in the original name that are deemed offensive. But this photo was taken in 1859, or perhaps 1858, and I think we have to be careful with sanitising history. Just because something is offensive, I think we shouldn't necessarily shrink away from it. I think that language is important, and I think that this is a primary source. And my book, Grungewick, is a collection of primary sources. And I think even things that offend us now, if we, if we airbrush them, if we sanitise them, we then can't build on that, that foundation of truth. And we actually need to know what people thought and what people said and the language they used in the past in order for us to move on today. Now, in actual fact, that'll be the last thing I say about Aboriginal people tonight. Um, by 1852, so that's 17 years after the Port Phillip colony began, there were only 38 Wurundjeri Willem remaining in the environs of Melbourne. And certainly in the research that I did, I didn't read a single uh, reference to any Aboriginal person in Brunswick. I came to Brunswick in 1987 and I moved into a top four floor flat, number 10, 96 Glen Lyon Road. And I loved it. And since then I've lived in Luscombe Street, in Victoria Street over in East Brunswick, in Hope Street in West Brunswick, in Westbourne Street in the middle of Brunswick, but I've remained within the Brunswick hood. Like all of you, I'm guessing, I, I love it here. Uh, a few years ago, uh, Penguin asked me to write a book about uh, unsung heroes of the outback. And I was up in, in Longreach doing some research for that, and I wanted to cross-reference some of the stories that I was reading. And so I was looking up old newspapers, contemporary newspaper reports. But even though I was in Longreach and on a hideous deadline, I still found my mouse clicking over to see what was happening in Brunswick at that time. And I really loved the stories that, um, that I was reading then. I've always enjoyed looking at old newspapers. When I, I grew up in the country and when I first moved down to Melbourne, I used to go to the State Library where you could actually look at the actual physical newspapers. And then there was microfiche and microfilm, which were both awkward technologies to use. Now, the National Library, their Trove website, you can sit at home and you can look up, you know, the Gympie Gazette from 1875 or anything that interests you from your home computer. And I think it's a wonderful resource. Before I go any further, just one word of caution about tonight. The, the material in the book and the stories I'm going to talk about tonight a pretty, a pretty full on. They're, some of these stories are, are, are pretty rough. Um, you won't be surprised to hear that the victims of crime in the 1800s 
were often the most vulnerable people. Women, children, infants, the poor. I'm aware that some of these stories are a bit hard to take, but I think that's what makes them worth remembering. But I, I just hope that there's nothing that's distressing for people. Having said that, if you think back to 1960s TV shows when they had a return to the past thing and the screen would go like that, just imagine, you can close your eyes if you want, you can imagine that we've moved back. We can tear up the concrete, pull up the bitumen, knock down the multi-storey apartment blocks. We walk outside into Sydney Road and it's an old gravel road, um, said to be the worst road in all of Melbourne. There's horses going up and down, some of them are pulling um, carts, some are, are pulling cabs. There's a couple of horses tethered outside the Retreat Hotel over here having a drink in the trough. It means what you can mainly smell out on the street is horse manure. There's a, a breeze from the southwest, so we can also smell the slaughterhouse down on Union Street. You can hear the goats and the cattle over in the paddocks of West Brunswick. You can see the blokes walking home from the quarry and, and the pottery and they're covered in dirt and soot. Going home, probably eating mutton and potatoes cooked on a, a, a wood stove. The Salvation Army Band might be just tuning up, up the street. Brunswick in the 1800s was a, a satellite town. It was three and a half miles from the city and actually relatively isolated. We look here, this is uh, Brunswick Road. Looks a little bit different nowadays. That's 1864. This is Albion Street looking west down towards um, Mooney Ponds Creek. Don't have a date on that one. Not a lot going on. This is a chap called Richard Rogers and his dray and actually a, a horse in magnificent condition. Um, I suppose they really had to look after their horses because that was their livelihood. This is the central business district. Pretty sleepy. Brunswick in the 1800s looked, smelled and sounded different. But in terms of crime there were certain themes that resonate today. Older people thought the youth were badly behaved. There was racial and religious intolerance that sometimes spilled into violence. Desperate people looked for criminal solutions to their poverty. And the men with the money made decisions for everyone else. One of the things that I have liked since I've, I've done the research is to walk around Brunswick and remember the things that have happened in places where I go. So this is a Sadler at 59 Sydney Road. Uh, he was also a news agent in the, in the 1880s. And I think differently about this place when I know that his brother-in-law, uh, who was called Ralph Smith, and Ralph was the collector of dog fees for the borough of Brunswick, hanged himself just in the back there. Nowadays, it's a noodle hut. And I, I, I greatly doubt that they know what went on there. <laughs> when I lived in Luscombe Street, we were around the corner from the Quarry Hotel and I was always aware that um, a ne'er-do-well called Brian Kane got uh, shot dead in the front bar there in the 1980s, I think it was, the early 80s. Um, but I've since discovered that the Quarry Hotel and in fact many other hotels was used for inquests. So when they found a dead body, they would take them to the, the nearest hotel for the autopsy and the subsequent uh, inquest. In 1887, there was a chap called William Sargent who was drinking in the Quarry Hotel. The licensee, who was a woman, interestingly enough, Elizabeth Shannon, she sent a member of her family down to the cellar to tap a hogshead of beer. They left the cellar door open. You've probably guessed what happened next. William kept on drinking and kept on walking and fell straight on his head. And the only upside I can see to that story is they wouldn't have had far to take the body for the <laughs> autopsy. One thing that I found confronting um, reading about a lot of the stories was the, the, the acceptance of a certain level of violence towards women and particularly violence towards women uh, within marriage. Um, one example of many um, from 1858. 
There was a chap called William Earl. Uh, his wife isn't given a name. She's Mrs. Earl. He was charged with assaulting his wife. This fellow, who's called John Rollo, um, he was a councillor on the very first Brunswick Council, which in fact sat at the Cornish Arms Hotel, just down the road here. John Rollo went to court and uh, testified that he saw them fighting. He heard her call out, murder, murder. Mrs Earl told him that her husband was trying to strangle her and that he had threatened to kill her several times. Earl stated that his wife had attempted to throw a kettle of boiling water over him and he was only trying to tie her hands behind her. The newspaper editorialised she was very aggravating in her temper, perhaps worse than he was. The bench dismissed the case. In 1883, which is not that long ago really, um, 132 years ago if my maths is right, Mary Speakman took Charles Archer to court for illegal detention of property, so he had something that belonged to her. But Mr Croker, who appeared for the defence, submitted that the complainant, being a married woman, had no separate estate and therefore could not sue in her own name. Her husband should have been party to the action. The bench coincided with that view and dismissed the complaint. If it was hard to be a woman, it was hard to be a child. Uh, September 1882, a two-line news story under the headline, A Waif. Louisa Abraham, a pretty little girl of about four years of age, was brought before the bench charged with being a neglected child, remanded for a week. Where was she remanded? Who looked after her? What happened to her? I don't know, and in fact, in most of the stories in Grunswick, I don't know what happened next, which is a, a, a frustration. Uh, 1885, Patrick McNamara was taken to Brunswick Court, charged with ill-treating Elizabeth Egan, a child boarded out with him. It was alleged that he sent the girl for some beer, and because it was a little thick, he beat her unmercifully with a heavy strap. Fine five pounds. And I'm really sorry, I wish that I was here to tell you jokes tonight or, or some uplifting tale that we could all walk out, but no, unfortunately we're, we're, we're digging the ditches of misery. I mentioned earlier that, that saddler in Sydney Road and, and how it changes my perception of it, knowing what happened there. This, as you know, is Merry Creek. And you can view this exact point in Merry Creek, which is at the very end of Albion Street, you can view it in two ways. You can be aware that in 1872 there was a little boy called Louis Ratchel, I think it's pronounced. His father was a German immigrant and a girl was pushing him along in a little barrow playing with him. He fell out of the barrow and fell into the creek. His sister, who was called Louisa, leaped in after him, but both of them drowned which is a very sad thing to think about when you look at, the, at that spot on the Merry Creek. Alternatively, you can think of 1884, when Henry Humphrey was charged with bathing in the Merry Creek, contrary to the bylaws of the borough. Repeated complaints have been made to the police of the number of boys bathing in the creek and disporting themselves on the bank in a nude condition, in the view of residents of the vicinity. As this was the first case of the kind this summer, a light penalty was inflicted and he was fined five shillings. Now it must have been a warm summer because one month later we see at Brunswick Police Court and Simpson was charged. The prosecutor stated that the, that the defendant, while in a drunken condition, stood at her door in a perfectly nude condition and used most filthy language in the hearing and view of persons passing. A fine of £10 was inflicted. So she got a £10 fine and he got a five shilling fine. And I'm not sure about the justice of that. When we lived in Victoria Street, one of the great pleasures was walking up and down the Merry Creek Path and we got to see the Russian Orthodox church built. And I thought then, and I think today, that those golden minarets are uh, one of the great glories of our built environment here in Brunswick. I can't say for certain that it was on that block of land, but somewhere very close to there was 
what was regarded as the finest uh, residence in Brunswick. The man who lived there was called Arthur Oliver and he died in 1882 and there's a curious obituary for him. Um, it calls him a very eccentric and distant man. He lived there with a boy who was his servant. His, his house had ferns, flowers, fountains, statuary. Inside there were superb furnishings. He had a, a host of musical instruments. He had a tree house 40 feet up in which he had lots of telescopes. And reading between the lines, it seems completely obvious that he must have been gay, but um, that wasn't reported at the time. Instead, he was, uh, he was made out to be this very odd man. So he left not only his house, but also £4,000, and I couldn't find out where the, the money went to. Not all court cases were major. And it's worth saying that the court, the Brunswick court, when it sat, it didn't have a, a magistrate coming up from the city, typically. It was the, the men who presided there were the town councillors. So they were also the landowners and the, the big employers. The separation of powers did not apply. February 1872, Joseph Hilton charged with exposing in his shop window Valentine's cards with a decidedly lewd tendency. 24 hours imprisonment. The same day, John O'Keefe found guilty of breaking a plum tree. Fine two shillings. Uh, November 1879, and this is a long time before the Hoon Laws were enacted, a man named Hegarty, who appears a few times in Grundwick, he was a very regular visitor to the courthouse, was charged by the inspector with furious driving. He must have had some sort of turbocharged horse, I think, you know, <laughs> mag wheels on the cart, fluffy dice. It transpired that this freak is a favourite pastime with Mr Hegarty, who had to pay for this latest exploit, 10 shillings and costs. January 1894, a robbery was committed at the premises of Henry Wallace, a draper in Carnarvon Street. Amongst the articles stolen being a quantity of India rubber hose and a cage containing three canaries. Sounds like the start of a short story, doesn't it? <laughs> this picture here, uh, J.A. Hutchinson, the draper. In 1887, a respectable looking woman, Elizabeth Sampson and her daughter, about 13, came along, were inspecting his wares out on the footpath. They picked up a roll of flannel, stuck it in their perambulator, covered it over to make it look like a baby, and took off down Sydney Road. But they were apprehended and found guilty. Uh, that is 429 to 431 Sydney Road, as you can see. Can you guess where it is now? It is... <laughs> Chemist Warehouse. Sometimes you hear people, and I may be one of those people, who get a little bit sick of, of nanny statism nowadays. Um, oh and regulations that we think are a little bit onerous, having to do a course before you can climb a, a three-step ladder at work, that sort of thing. But one thing I realised reading the articles for the book was just how appalling <laughs> oh and or how, how there actually was no oh and in the past. Brunswick, as you know, was, it was a place of quarries and clay holes and potteries. This, I love this photo. This is um, just down near Temple Park. John Glue owned that, um, that clay hole. I don't know if this is a house, but if so, it's just teetering on the edge there. Um, yeah, not a lot of safety fencing. This is actually a map from uh, 1896, so later on. This is exactly where Barclay Square is nowadays and exactly where the car park is. So they were all giant clay holes. This is uh, a stone quarry over on Nicholson Street. Can you guess what's there now? The beautiful Our Lady Catholic Church and Catholic School. And if you've ever noticed that Catholic School has got a dug away section and a, a stone wall, that's what it used to look like with all those fantastic horses. These likely lads are from uh, Hoffman's Brickwork, just down the road here. 
uh, this is this photo is from the 1920s, but even as late as the 20s, you can see great big clay hole here on the corner of this is Pearson Street running along here. This is the Grandview Hotel. Great big clay hole here. Great big clay hole here, and we're tonight we're sitting about there. Um, j just a, a few examples from very, very many. Um, 1874, a youth named Stuart incautiously looked over the hopper of the pug mill when in full motion. His head got jammed by the revolving beam at the end of which a horse was attached. The animal was stopped instantly, but not before the lad's jaws were broken and it is reported his skull also. The same year, a labourer named Pettit by some means slipped from his work, falling over 40 feet. Next year, Thomas Barry had a fit while standing on a plank, repairing machinery at Hoffman's, admitted to Melbourne Hospital with concussion of the brain, bruises on the head. 1891, an inquest at the Grandview Hotel, which we saw is just down here on Pearson Street, on the death of Charles Andrews at Hoffman Brick Company. So they brought the body up from here. Blown up while preparing dynamite. The foreman theorised that since Andrews was a smoker, a match may have fallen through a hole in one of his pockets and ignited the dynamite prematurely. And the last example is 1885. A 16-year-old, John Della Hunty at Hoffman's. Uh, the unfortunate lad was clearing out dirt from underneath one of the rolling tables when he lost his hold of the shovel. In, in endeavouring to regain it, he became entangled in the powerful machinery, the result being that his right leg was torn away above the knee joint and he died a few hours later of the blood loss. But when they held the inquest, uh, the foreman said that no, there was no safety equipment on the machinery, but why would you need it? It was not necessary because no one should go near it. We move from that unhappy story to the most notorious and best known, and yes, very unhappy story, uh, probably of Brunswick ever, and certainly Brunswick in, oh, the brickworks today, you'll recognise that. The brickworks again today, uh, Gilpin Park. So you can sort of see the mounding. So this, of course, was all quarried out. Frances Nor. She was born in the UK, in England. Her name was Minnie Thwaites. As a teenager, she was sent away to a home for wayward girls. And when she came out of that, she was dispatched to Australia. When she arrived in Australia, she married uh, a German petty criminal called Rudolf Knorr. Apparently she was a, a, very, a very big woman, both tall and, and heavy uh, for that time, which is not, not relevant. But um, She worked in Sydney for a little bit, worked in Melbourne for a little bit. Occupations that were on the fringes of the law, um, possibly prostitution at different times. The 1890s, of course, was a depression in Melbourne, a serious depression, and Brunswick was hit extremely hard by that depression. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier how hard it was to be a woman uh, often in that time and, and how, how hard it was to be a child. In 1893, the city health officer, Dr Neal, told a royal commission that of 500 post-mortems he'd conducted on infants, more than half indicated murder. So of the 500 babies that came before him, more than half had been murdered. And you think about it and you think there was no money. There was no contraception, probably not much access, if any, to abortion. There was big families. What happens if there's an extra, um, extra mouth to feed? What about domestic servants who become pregnant to their employer um, who then won't allow the baby to, to stay under the same roof. What about women who were raped? What about the, the children of prostitutes and their clients? A, a, a lot of, of babies being born and, uh, and fewer babies surviving. So one uh, occupation that began to thrive was called the baby farmer, which was effectively someone who would be paid to take your baby and look after it. She became a baby farmer. She lived up in Davies Street in a block that goes through to Moreland Road. And I actually, I, I know 
which house she lived in, and I decided not to, not to identify it because it's, uh, you know, for reasons you can probably understand. So she lived in, in Davies Street and at some point she began to, to kill the babies that she was looking after. Uh, at some point, the neighbour from Moorland Road was digging in his garden and he found a baby. The police soon after found two more um, babies buried there. there. There may have been others. Um, she fled to Sydney where a week later she gave birth to her fourth child, her own fourth child. She was 24. Uh, but she was captured in Surrey Hills in Sydney, brought back to Melbourne. At first she said it was all the fault of uh, her lover, who was called Edward Thompson. But at the same time, while she was in prison, and it interests me because we have her handwritten letter and she was obviously a, a woman with, with, with many, many uh, literacy skills. Uh, it's, it's a long and well-written letter. She's written a letter to Edward um, explaining to him in you know, a lot of detail how he should manufacture evidence uh, and how he should pay some witnesses to exonerate her. But she was found guilty very quickly, sentenced to death by hanging. At that time, they had a, a regulation that the hangman had to stay in prison with the condemned person for a week beforehand. The hangman uh, typically was uh, a criminal and there was concerns about them going AWOL. That seems to have been the reasoning. Even though uh, her crime shocked people, uh, there were a lot of people who believed that a woman should not be executed. Even though she wouldn't, she was, uh, I think, the fourth of five women ever executed in Victoria. So the hangman checked into the prison and then killed himself. But they found someone else, a, a police constable, uh, to execute her. Just before she died, she wrote a letter to the Premier, Mr Patterson, about baby farming and made suggestions for its better regulation. And she also wrote that she was guilty, a note of confession. And this is her death mask, which is uh, on display down at Old Melbourne Jail. The main uh, non-European migrant group in Brunswick in the 1800s were Chinese. This photo is actually from Queensland of a Chinese market gardener. I couldn't find one from Brunswick. We have um, a pretty rotten history of uh, prejudice towards Asian immigrants uh, generally and certainly towards the Chinese in the 1800s. Once again, I think these stories are worth remembering because we can trace them through and we can see similar things happening with other groups, similar demonisation, similar persecution, whether it's um, uh, the Italians or uh, the Baltic people or Greeks. Vietnamese, or more latterly, I suppose, uh, people who come from various nations, but who are Muslim. Uh, 1882, a Chinaman named Long Fang was charged with stealing water to the value of five shillings for his market garden. He was sentenced to one month's imprisonment with hard labour, and he was an elderly man. In 1891, and this is the second and last uh, example of many, sadly, uh, a man named R. Fong sued George McIntyre, claiming that McIntyre deliberately rode over him while he was walking along the footpath in Nicholson Street. John Atchison, a driver from Ford Brothers, stated that he had seen McIntyre ride over the Chinaman. But the court found the act was not done willfully. The defendant, R. Fong, was fined 20 shillings and two pounds, two shillings costs. In case you thought this was all too merry, we're now going to move towards the story which for me is, is probably the saddest of the lot. Um, and it happens near the old Cumberland Arms Hotel, uh, which you'll recognise now. We've got the, the cafe down here and the walkway through to, uh, to Woolworths or the Safeway. In 1891, there was a fire um, next uh, in a fruit shop. Uh, just here on this side of the laneway, which destroyed the fruit shop and the adjoining building, which was also a fruit shop. Fires were a big deal uh, at that time because um, the telegraph to the city of Melbourne was unreliable and we only had a volunteer fire service here. 
Here's the volunteer fire service from the 1890s. This one here is the fire tower and it was just over the road here on the corner of Saxon Street. And it must have been quite tall because there's figures here and I assume they're children. But if you, um, if you look it out, uh, it must have been quite a sight, that fire tower. This is James Lurie and presumably these are his children. They all appear to be girls, so presumably his daughters. This is his fruit shop. This is the fruit shop that was burnt down. This is the walkway through to, through to Woolworths there. Uh, in 1893, Emily Victoria Lurie, aged 12 years, Catherine Alice, her sister aged eight, and their friend Wilhelmina Kennedy, aged 10. They went for a walk. This is the map of Brunswick to which I referred. So they were living just here. They walked, uh, they walked over to there. Not a long walk to a very deep clay hole where the surface of the water was 80 feet below street level and then there was 10 feet of water. There was a little raft there. And they thought they'd have a ride on it. Wilhelmina Kennedy became frightened and evidently not conscious of her risk, wanted to jump ashore. Her movements for this purpose causing the timbers to sway uneasily, she lost her balance and in attempting to save herself she caught hold of Catherine Lurie and in a moment the two girls were in the water struggling with each other for support. The eldest of the three, Victoria Lurie, was left alone on the plank. Seeing the other two come to the surface, she, with distinguished bravery, gallantly jumped into the water to render assistance at the same time giving a terrific scream, which you can imagine. And you can also imagine, the newspaper goes on later, as the bodies of the poor little children were being carried up to the top of the vast embankment, the scene was far beyond description. The screams and bitter tears that were shed were heart-rending. It was not without the aid of some kind neighbours that Mrs Lurie was taken to her home, where that day a deep and very dark cloud of sorrow rested. Now, as if that's not enough misery, there is a postscript. Eleven months later, I found another news story. A rather serious accident, and one which it is feared will have a fatal termination, occurred at Brunswick, whereby a man named James Lurie sustained very serious injuries. It appears that Lurie, for some purpose at present unexplained, and perhaps in 2015 we can guess, climbed to the top of an unused brick kiln adjoining his house in Victoria Street and by some means fell to the ground. His groans were heard by some passers-by. Injury to the spine as well as the head, face much cut about, not thought that he would survive. The spot where the three little girls drowned, as best I can work out, would be around about there just at the end of the brand spanking new Brunswick Skate Park, which is a terrific moorland facility, and next to the uh, all-weather soccer pitch there. A lot of bodies were found in a lot of clay holes. Um, an example, another example of a story that I'm sorry does not have a conclusion, it's, it's, it's an, an incident rather than a story, occurred in Phoenix Street, so just over here. The Brunswick Baths didn't arrive in that position till I think about 1913. Prior to that they were over where the medical centre is now. Uh, 20 feet back from the railway line, so around about there, a woman's body was found by some schoolboys. They thought it was a bundle of rags floating on the water. She was dressed in a light red coloured print dress, two cotton and one flannel petticoats, a pair of dark woolen stockings and a pair of odd kid boots. Several marks of violence were found on the body. One of the woman's cotton petticoats having been drawn up and twisted round her throat. The deceased is a perfect stranger in Brunswick, about 100 persons having viewed the body, none of whom can identify her. The body was removed to the Cumberland Arms Hotel where an inquest will be held. One of the other really notorious stories of Brunswick at that time happened in this street. It was a short street then and it's a short street now. Walter Street, it runs off Albion Street, 
At that time it only had four houses in it, three weatherboard, one brick. The Depression years again, 1893. One of the houses is occupied by Mary Ann Rickman. She is a tailor, or to use the terminology of the time, a tailoress. She's a widow, her husband had died at sea. She had one son called Albert, who she doted on. A family moves in next door to her, the Chatfield family. They have uh, some adopted children. One of their children and Mrs Rickman's son have some sort of clash and after that it's strife. The neighbours hate each other. They're throwing things over each other's fences. They're throwing things on each other's roofs. Um, they can't move because under the, the situation at the time they were paying uh, money into a building society for their house. If they moved they would have lost all that money. They couldn't resell the house. They had to stay there. They were stuck with each other. One day Mrs Rickman sees Mrs Chatfield in the street and bashes her across the face with a bundle of sticks and then she slaps her until she goes to the ground. Mrs Chatfield goes to the police and then goes off to um, uh, her mother-in-law's place. Mrs Rickman is scheduled to attend court charged with that assault. But at half past one in the morning before she's due in court, Mr Chatfield is on his own in his house and he looks up and he says he sees a glowing light and behind it Mrs Rickman's face. And then there is an enormous explosion. The police are called and the other neighbours instantly say it'll be Mrs Rickman. They don't get on. <coughs> the police go round to Mrs Rickman's house and they're about to go in. There's another huge explosion. So what's happened is she's gone in there with a stick of dynamite and thrown it at him. It's blown off his left leg. He's later on had to have one eye removed. He's got burns to a lot of his body. She's then gone home. She's already written her suicide note and she's going to put the dynamite in her mouth. But as she raises it to her mouth, it explodes prematurely and blows off her hand and half of her arm. So anyway, she is of course taken to court She's clearly guilty. The only question is the question of sanity. Uh, the local doctor, Dr Overend, said that he believed she was insane, melancholia, hallucinations, which often lead to suicide or homicidal mania. Dr Dick, superintendent of lunatic asylums, said he examined her twice. He thought she was sane. The jury took only 10 minutes and she was found insane and detained in jail and I don't know what happens to her after that, or to him. You've no doubt heard people complain that the streets of Brunswick aren't as safe as they used to be. I don't believe that's true. <laughs> and in fact, if we, if we look at, at crime data, you know, Melbourne, despite some awful high profile crimes, is a safer place now than it's ever been. But at that time, they had larrikins ne'er-do-wells. Uh, the main problem with the street hooligans was they would congregate along Sydney Road and different uh, corners were home base for different gangs. In 1885 we hear that half a dozen grown-up larrikins, downright unmitigated blackguards, were amusing themselves by throwing stones at houses, windows, lamps etc and were varying the amusement by plastering people's dwellings with mud and rotten eggs. One young vagabond shied a stone at a lamp. Uh, that photo is actually from 1900, but it may well have been a lamp a lot like that one. That cost five pounds, smashing it into pieces. The following year, 1886, four larrikin youths assault Chinese market gardeners, throwing stones at them, punching them, and hitting them across their faces with horse whips. A decade later, a letter to the editor from a person who signed herself a respected young lady Noted, insolent fellows are allowed to molest every young lady that passes on Sydney Road. Thinking themselves manly in their actions, these impudent boys crowd the footpath smoking and spitting over people's clothes. Not very pleasant. In 1898, uh, another letter to the editor noted that the most notorious are the Victoria Street corner push, who go under the sobriquet of the pie stallers. No single person of either sex can, without being insulted, past these foul-smelling riffraff. Nowadays, we can just look in Franco Cozzo's window. It's a lot more peaceful, a lot happier. I've got two stories left. 
The first one is a story that I had never heard of, and I'm not sure why I had never heard of it. Uh, it, it was a riot in Sydney Road with 25,000 people involved. So in 1896, the local Orange Lodge held a service at the Wesleyan Church, which you will recognise nowadays as Sydney Road Community School, to commemorate the anniversary of the Battle of the Boyne, a Catholic versus Protestant fight in 1690, and then they marched on Sydney Road with their orange regalia. 25,000 people turned up in Sydney Road down near the Sarah Sands, nowadays called Bridie O'Reilly's. That's the Sarah Sands as it looked in 1870. When I arrived in Brunswick in 87, there were still strippers there. I didn't go along. <laughs> 25,000 people outside the Sarah Sands wearing orange or green ribbons, many holding shillelaghs or lumps of blue road metal. And then reading verbatim from the newspapers of the time. The people were beginning to get restless, like animals when they smell blood. An open buggy containing four men who all showed orange rosettes. From the front of an adjacent cab, one could see a sudden attack by a party of men armed with stout sticks. A momentary repulse, a renewed assault, a rearing horse, a capsizing buggy. They wrote well in those days, didn't they? The sticks were going with extraordinary rapidity as the four men standing up in the buggy dealt out their blows, while the weapons of their assailants came up upon their heads and shoulders with a straight up and down chopping motion. Then a buggy containing an old man and an old woman was wedged in the centre of the throng, and the old lady, who was rapturously watching the progress of a distant scuffle, drew a large orange-coloured handkerchief from the front of her dress and waved it contemptuously in the faces of the foe. Three men jumped on the buggy like wolves, and in a second the old lady's bonnet and handkerchief, not to mention a few wisps of her grey hair, were down on the ground and a lively battle was waged around them. On all sides there were cut heads and bleeding faces, then a cry that someone had a knife, a scene of intense excitement, several voices crying out, lynch him, lynch him. A pleasing feature amid the general disturbance was the behaviour of the Reverend Father Luby, the popular parish priest of Brunswick from St Ambrose's over the road here, who endeavoured with all the force of his eloquence to dissuade his unruly flock from continuing the disturbance. A final item. We know that in modern Brunswick there can be tensions between cyclists and non-cyclists. We know that at Moreland Council there can be tensions over who, uh, who gets access when to recreational facilities. This is the Victory Cycle Club and that photo was taken in 1897 and a member of the club was Mr W.C. Bones, and I don't know which one he is, although I'd rather like it to be that one. <laughs> he has written to the newspaper asking for a fair go for cyclists. 30 cyclists training at Brunswick Reserve with 50 footballers, and the footballers are deliberately aiming their kicks at the riders. Quote, they wait until a rider comes between them and then kick two balls at the rider as he passes. There have been several accidents. I got a nasty fall, broke my machine and hurt my arm and head and was greeted with the shout, here's another over and a laugh. The Victory Club has spent and collected more money than any club and cyclists should have their track to themselves at least from 5 to 6 p.m. each day. And here's the likely lads of the Brunswick Football Club. We don't know which ones are the villains, maybe all of them. All we want is for people to get along with each other. It wasn't easy in the 1800s and it isn't easy now, but at least we can try. Thank you so much for coming along.